So welcome everyone to another in the Transforming Assessment webinar series, but this is a very special one for us today because we're doing this in collaboration with our colleagues at eAssessment Scotland. Uh, we did this last year, 2012, for the Assessment Scotland conference, and we're very pleased to be able to do this again this year. So welcome everyone, wherever you are in the world. So to the, uh, today, tonight, uh, this morning, wherever you are, we're very fortunate to have Courtney Harris, uh, Connie Price and Helen Flavel from Curtin University in Perth here in Australia uh, to give us a presentation today on e-marking workflows in a university setting. So I'm going to hand over to Courtney, Connie and Helen now uh, to take the mic and to start the presentation. Good morning, afternoon and evening, depending on where you are in the hemisphere. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here today and to present to you on challenges and opportunities associated with implementing e-marking workflows in a university setting. I'm Courtney Harris and I'm from the School of Occupational Therapy and Social Work in the Faculty of Health Sciences. I'm in charge of the introductions and will talk with you about the undergraduate unit we have imp implemented e-marking strategies into and what were the drivers for this approach. Connie Price, the Manager of Assessment at Curtin Teaching and Learning, will highlight some of the issues with assessment in the 21st century as well as the process and workflows we've developed for the electronic management of assignments. Lastly, Helen Flavel will introduce you to the research project we've been undertaking this year that has been funded through the Office of Teaching and Learning aimed at, to assist in developing capacity for adult teaching with the use of information technology. We're all from work together at Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia and even though it's winter here right now, we still have the sunshine and the views that you see in these photos here around us as we're talking. Please feel free to ask questions and use the chat and we will attempt to answer these questions as we move through. I'll hand you over to Connie now. Hello everyone. Um, I thought we would just begin today's session by taking a look at where assessment might be situated in the 21st century context. So as many of you are probably aware, there's a lot of buzz going on at the moment about the influence of some of the technologies um, and some of the drivers around the higher education sector, for instance, MOOCs, and what that might mean in terms of will universities exist in the near future, and if they continue to exist, what sort of state will they be in? Um, this can also include accrediting, um, sorry, the, this sometimes creates threats to the existence of universities, and there's discussion that suggests that one of the key roles of universities has transformed from being that of a knowledge delivery situation to accrediting student learning. And as we can see, the, this creates um, a greater focus in terms of the role that assessment will play in a university environment and there will be a greater value placed on those assessments. We also can see the infiltration of technology and um, that can come in a variety of ways. We see it both within our teaching and also within assessment. Within assessment and related to some of the other points on the slide, we're going to be finding that there's a greater emphasis on aspects of assessment that might be automated or done by artificial intelligence in order for us to handle the size and scale of the number of students that we're going to be dealing with. In most countries, there's uh, an a decrease in government funding for higher education and this can lead to um, decreased um, funds available at the local level within each of the areas or schools doing the teaching. And uh, at our university, this is creating um, a desire for us to have a more accurate costing model for assessment and particularly to look at different kinds of assessments and what costs those um, incur. In Australia, we have a new regulatory body called uh, TEXA and both external to the university and internal, there's an increasing um, drive for accountability. And this, when we look at assessment, creates a greater proportion of workload that is not just in the process of doing marking, but around marking. So an increased uh, requirement for moderation, increased uh, emphasis on addressing academic integrity issues such as plagiarism. Also with um, MOOCs, but also um, 
different funding models and in Australia we've had a, a, a lifting of some of the caps that allow students to attend the university with funding and that creates a, a greater increase in the number of students that we have coming into some of our programs and as Courtney will explain that has um, been quite dramatic over the last couple of years and produces for us um, increasing workload in every aspect of assessment. So everything that we used to do traditionally around assessment is magnified. And finally, um, increasing diversity amongst the student population. So we've got students from a variety of um, socioeconomic bands, but also uh, increasing international students participating in our courses. And um, also with the widening of the number of students coming, you'll see a difference in their level of capability. So uh, in terms of assessment, this creates an increased need for um, appropriate feedback structures to allow students to uh, be successful in this environment. That's not a, a full summary of the assessment issues in the 21st context, but it sort of sets some of the issues that uh, influenced the um, program and the process that we are undertaking here at Curtin. I'll now hand back to Courtney to describe uh, the unit that we're working with. The unit that we've been working with to develop an arting strategy is called Foundations of Professional Health Practice 100. This is one of the common first year units that all first year health science students undertake in their first semester of first year when they come to Curtin. It's a super large unit. We have 2,900 students across both semesters and we have a teaching staff of about 40. An essential theme throughout this common first year is an interprofessional education and how we set that up in terms of the staff and students is that we have classes of 50 students and we cap the amount of students from each school that can be in one class. So for example you might have six social work students with six paramedics with six OTs, six physios to make up that 50. Um, this, it's co-taught with two tutors and they are both from different disciplines within health sciences. We have internal um, students face-to-face -face, as well as external student enrolments in the unit. Uh, an example for you is last semester we had three classes of 50 students running simultaneously all week from 8am Monday morning till 6pm Friday afternoon. The, teach, the unit's delivered um, through a one-hour tutorial and two-hour workshop. Students work in interprofessional teams of about four to five students and they work in a range of practical activities, a little bit like you can see in the photo here. And um, they work in these teams to explore the learning outcomes of the unit. Students use technology in the classrooms to watch some videos, short podcasts, do online quizzes, internet searches to complete workbook activities. So why did we look to implement e-marking in this unit? Well given the large numbers of students and staff in, in this unit we felt that time and the potential risk of losing assessments in the process of receiving, date stamping, collating, allocating, delivering of these assessments to tutors was just too great. With time being used with administration of the assessments it meant that greater time between student submission and them receiving their feedback which was often um, performative assessments was not helpful for the students and their learning. On completion of tutors grading assessments, again there's time taken to get these um, assessments maybe back to other tutors for moderation purposes and then to disseminate them back to the students. Additionally, academic integrity detection processes are also more difficult to implement across tutors and student assessments manually. Again, due to the large number of students and 40 staff, ensuring consistency of feedback in terms of assigning of grades and comments is a challenge. Using marking rubrics with defined assessment criteria and embedded feedback allow transparency for students and for staff. The embedded feedback that we used on rubrics was related to the unit learning outcomes which therefore helped the tutors be more efficient with their time as they could highlight these focused feedback on the rubrics rather than edit students' papers, which was a traditional way of them giving students feedback. Lastly, um, we have had lots of students provide us with their feedback on the unit and the assessment and, the, and marking process often was one of the things that they commented on and students were frustrated with the inconsistency in the grades between the students, the inconsistencies among tutors with the amount and the type of feedback that was given. You can imagine with 40 tutors um, that that could vary 
and also they complained about the delays in receiving their feedback, particularly informative assessments, which they would then use that feedback for their next assessment. So you can see that we therefore felt that we had lots of reasons and many drivers for implementing e-marking strategies to overcome some of these issues. I'm now going to hand you back to Connie. Okay, thank you, Courtney. Um, I'm going to walk through some of our, our process, and it has definitely been a journey. Uh, we started this about three years ago, and um, you can see as we, we talk through, there were many decisions that were made along the way, and some of them were great decisions, and some of them created some challenges for us. So to start with, I just want to sort of outline uh, a typical assessment management workflow. And I'm going to start with the workflow that we're all most familiar with in the traditional format where the student submits the work uh, as a paper copy or a hard copy. And then it, those hard copies are distributed to the different individuals who are going to do the marking. During the marking process or grading process, um, we often add comments um, and feedback to the student's paper copy um, by using highlighting pens or just um, writing in the margins. And um, there are a variety of different approaches to um, coming to the conclusion of a grade. Sometimes it was just an overall holistic evaluation of the student's work, and that was simply placed on the hard copy. Um, and increasingly, over time, we felt that there was uh, a greater need for accountability about how that mark was derived. So um, most of us have implemented things like marking keys or a rubric, and the rubric in this case we're talking about is the two-dimensional table that describes both the criteria and the levels of achievement, and then for each of the cells is a specific descriptor of what the student needs to be able to demonstrate in order to um, be given that particular um, mark or component of the mark. Um, at some point, if you are using a, a marking key or a rubric, you need to calculate the grade, and, and this may seem like a trivial step in this process, but um, there's a good reason why I've included it in this workflow. And then finally, you would record your grade in some sort of system. Initially, um, this was, of course, on paper, and then more increasingly, it became um, common to, to record your grades in something like an Excel spreadsheet, and then um, upload those results to your university system for um, recording student final marks. But the individual marks um, were often not captured in any particular way. And then finally, of course, when um, moderation processes have been completed, the paper copy of the student's work with the feedback on it, um, and also probably with the attached rubric or marking key, would be returned to the students. Um, that could either be through some sort of uh, formal process where you might have an office or an admin staff who are responsible for both receiving and returning that, those um, hard copies, or it could be um, that the uh, papers are returned to students in their next tutorial class. Um, and you always know that there's that extra lot of students who didn't attend that class, and a common practice was to have a box of um, assignments sitting outside your office or outside the um, admin office within the local area. So as Courtney mentioned, there were some specific drivers for why we felt that this assessment workflow needed to be um, managed at least in part um, electronically. So you'll see that um, the submission aspect um, was the first step, which was to have the students submit electronic copy. And most learning management systems have some sort of assignment drop box to allow this um, part of the workflow. And then at the end, we also saw that um, in order to uh, improve the, the privacy of student work so that you couldn't have a student picking up the wrong student's work um, and some of the issues that can occur from that where students might not yet have submitted and have um, received somebody else's work as a shortcut to getting their assignment completed, um, we wanted to have a more secure way of returning work. But what that also creates, if you're going to have electronic return of work, it means that the document either must remain in electronic format throughout the workflow, or it must be converted back into an electronic workflow. So in the first iteration of this um, process, where students are submitted electronically, the tutors actually had an option as to whether they would mark on screen, or that if they wanted to, they could print it out and use the traditional processes and then scan the um, subsequent copies back into the system. Of course, this creates a download, print, and scan and upload um, elements to the workflow. 
The next component of it is at Curtin University, we now have a policy requirement that all grades for each assessment must be recorded in the grade center of our learning management system, which is Blackboard. And as I'll point out in a few slides, it's not just that the grade is recorded, um, but that we have an auditable trail of the um, different activities on that grade. So if the grade needs to be changed, that we can see both who made the change and what the change to the grade might have been. Now, a couple of years ago, Courtney and I were both attending an Apple University Convertium session um, that they were running on the use of the iPad in higher education. And um, we got this great idea that perhaps one of the things that we could do is to um, use this new tool in a way that would allow some aspects of the workflow to be um, improved. And so we decided that if we could put the, the rubric on the iPad, we could design an electronic um, PDF form with autocomplete components where the grade might be automatically calculated um, and also would speed up the, the marking process because you would just have some tick boxes that you had to complete um, by just tapping on them. And um, that way the, the, the process of filling out the rubric was um, more automatic. And so we did that. So of course the calculating of the grade was um, then automated, and that's why that step was important in that workflow. Um, but we still had the situation where academics had um, choice about how they went about doing the annotation component. So then, um, the university provided um, a number of iPads to be used within this unit, and that was actually quite a large number. And at the time, it was a, a fairly unique sort of situation to offer staff um, the use of iPad. Most of them had never actually used that type of device, and many were not necessarily even familiar with the Apple environment and may not have had things like an iPhone um, to be familiar with how those types of devices tend to operate. So it was a learning curve for them just to take on the use of a new device, but then to add that into their workflow, we found some interesting things. So some people, as I say, continue to um, mark on screen but using the iPad adjacent to the screen, almost creating a two-screen situation. And um, some people would continue to print and do the annotation um, manually. When we actually um, went to implement this, I designed this slide to sort of outline to staff what the workflow was going to be uh, when they went about this. And we were a bit surprised when we actually put it all down. It had sounded like a fantastic idea at the time. But as you can see, it's a rather complex process and um, involved um, multiple devices. So you had to set up your iPad, but you also had to set up your computer if you're using the computer. And um, they were using um, smart views in Blackboard in order to manage the very large class list. And that also created some issue, or in, ends up creating some issues with how um, the workflow going into the, the um, Smart View and Grade Center, and then if you go out to something else and you have to come back, and sometimes things would time out, and then they'd have to log back in and um, add extra time in, in that step. Um, the pre-marking tasks were just simply to access the student submission. So you can see here that we're still stuck in that process of having to download the student assignment file and open it up. So instead of printing it, you would have to open it up into one of two uh, preferred uh, tools, either Microsoft Word or Adobe Acrobat, in order to add um, comments um, or to use the, um, the dreaded track changes in Microsoft Word, which sometimes promotes people to edit students' work rather than to comment on students' work. And then, of course, they had to open the marking rubric on the iPad. Within the marking tasks, we asked them to check originality um, of the document because the students were, in fact, submitted via Turnitin assignment link. So they needed to do that as well. Then they needed to add comments to the student file and complete the rubric. And then they had to go back to the Grade Center, and they had to take the completed rubric from the iPad and move it through a file transfer protocol to um, the computer so they could attach it in the Grade Center and then also locate and attach the annotated student document. Um, as you can imagine, this workflow has a particular effect on um, some of our t tutorial staff, um, something like this. And so we realized that what we had tried to do to help staff um, with some of these processes 
added on to the fact that this was a new device that many of them had not used, it does function in a lot of ways different to a computer. Um, it certainly created some increased um, anxiety and uh, a lot more learning that needed to happen um, during the process. Um, around this time, we also at the university were looking at how we might consider electronic working workflows um, more broadly at the university. And I was very fortunate to have worked with Courtney in this unit because it had given me some really important insights into what some of the issues would be. So at Curtin, we ran an online survey of staff and had some follow-up focus um, group sessions to identify um, current use of marking processes, things like the use of Audacity to create audio mark um, comments for feedback to students, or even just at that time, their impression of what electronic marking was, was in fact screen marking using programs that I've described, such as Microsoft Word or Adobe. And so the um, marking working party was interested to see if there were other tools on the market that could help to facilitate this workflow. And the working party came up with this list of priorities. So primarily based on our experience in the Foundations for Professional Health Practice Unit, we decided that workflow was one of the principal things that we needed to consider. It's not okay just to have a tool that will do all the different steps. You really need to take a look at how many steps the workflow creates and also to minimize the different um, applications that the user has to interact with. Even something as simple as does um, the tool allow you to have both the rubric and the student's work on one screen, or are they having to switch between two different applications because staff aren't necessarily comfortable in doing that and doing that quickly. Um, you'll find that lots of people prefer to have two screens so they can have each of those two documents on a different screen um, as they go. Also minimizing the overall workload, so that's the workload in managing all of the different steps in the process as well as the workload for the actual marking and grading component of it and also moderation. The second um, priority we had was that we wanted to ensure that whichever marking workflow we chose allowed us to continue to use the um, academic, academic integrity workflow that we were already using, so being able to check plagiarism using Turnitin. It also needed to um, facilitate the processes of moderation. And um, increasingly, there's a need for us to archive or keep a record of the student's document and the feedback, not just for appeals processes, but also for accreditation and assurance of learning types of activities. And then, of course, um, it's listed third, but it was the principal component, um, which was the overall features of the, the software that would allow um, evaluation of the student's work and the production of a mark, uh, as well as the marking up of the artifact, and potentially the ability to provide feedback in a variety of ways. So the next three slides I've got for you are the workflows that the working party um, created or mocked up based on three different products. So this product, uh, sorry, this workflow here is simply the, the um, typical workflow just using Blackboard Learn 9.1 as it was at that time. And you can see that there are a number of activities that occur in the Blackboard environment, but uh, there was still the need to download the student submission and open it up in some other desktop application either Microsoft Word or Acrobat in order to annotate the, the, um, the work. And then on the right hand side you've got the student workflow so that you can see how it goes backwards and forwards between the, um, the university and the student. One of the products that we were uh, quite hopeful about initially was uh, Remarks PDF. But as you can see the comparison between the previous slide and this slide, when we actually mapped out the workflow we found that um, there were three different applications that had to be dealt with separately, and the number of steps in the process was actually much more complex. And finally, we evaluated um, Turnitin's product, which is called Grademark, and you can simply you can see the simplicity of the workflow and the reduction in the number of steps that are required um, as we go here. One of the problems that we did discover with uh, Grademark is that there are two different building blocks for integrating it with um, the learning management system Blackboard. There was the traditional building block called Blackboard Basic. And although it does the automatic calculation of grade from the rubric and transfers that grade into the grade center, we discovered that it didn't actually complete our audit trail requirements of recording 
the person who had made the change and the date and time. And so we were forced to consider the new product that's offered by Turnin, which is called Turnitin Direct. And so it was actually that particular product that we determined would be the best solution to pilot at Curtin University, and we've done that in the first semester of this year. Unfortunately, that particular building block is still quite um, embryonic. It's, it's developing. Of course, it's been released for use, but um, I would be curious to see if anybody else has had any um, experience with that. We certainly discovered some issues um, during that first semester, and we have not rolled it out more broadly than the small pilot group that were using it in the first semester for our second semester, which has just started a couple of weeks ago, because we want to ensure that the changes and the upgrades to the building block um, are producing a, a, an effective and um, efficient workflow before we um, look at rolling that out more broadly. The other thing that we noted through the project with the Foundations for Professional Health Practice Unit was that um, one of the barriers that we saw with uh, implementation of this type of electronic workflow stemmed from the tutor's comfort and abilities to take on technologies. And um, this is a quote that comes from the 2013 Technology Outlook Report from New Media Consortium, the Horizon Project. And I'll just read through some of the, the components. The um, first paragraph basically identifies that this um, survey of Australian higher education environment was in fact in agreement with the global um, group that looks at um, digital media literacy um, across a number of different locations. And it found that the media literacy is not pervasive enough in faculty training, not just in Australia, but more broadly. There's a need for more training for staff um, that are being asked to teach and professional development opportunities once they're actually in that teaching role. Um, the key challenges that are underscored, there's a widespread belief that most academics are not actually leveraging um, the emerging technologies sufficiently within their own work um, in teaching, but also with um, their, their research. And therefore, there's potentially a progressive um, mountain that they have to climb whenever uh, a new technology comes on board. It very much depends on whether they've begun to take up the different kinds of technology and are becoming more and more comfortable, or whether they have pushed off that as an, something that's not yet required by the institution, and therefore the day of, of reckoning has not yet arrived for them. Unfortunately, when the day of reckoning does arrive, they've got a very large mountain to climb in a rather quick um, succession, and we're starting to see that here at Curtin with different changes to policy that are now requiring the use of Turnitin and uh, electronic submission. And the last paragraph is saying that while a lack of adequate training opportunities is part of the challenge, ultimately what we're faced with is a change in the mindset of the d disciplines and individual faculty. Uh, and this requires a cultural shift within academics, within the institution, before emerging tools and technology are routinely adopted and implemented as a matter of course. There's also an excellent quote that um, we've been um, using, which is by Matthew Allen, who was a, a lecturer here at Curtin. And it talks about this um, characteristic of an academic who is capable of taking on new technologies and being agile in the use of technologies and willing to take um, new things and try them out. Um, and we found that that was a feature that we wanted to see if we could find some way to foster in academic staff. And so that was the, the foundation of the OLT project that Helen will now describe. So I'll hand over to Helen. Okay, sorry everyone, I'm relatively new to this technology. Um, so we, um, apply, well, Courtney and Connie apply for some funding from the Office for Learning and Teaching, um, which is um, a national body which aims to promote research and um, a greater valuing of uh, teaching and learning within higher education. So what we did was um, we developed a professional development um, workshop that actually um, uh, functioned two purposes, one as an introduction to the unit for staff and what was going to be happening, but also a focus on how we could actually shift their, um, their attitudes, I suppose, and 
develop more agility in, able, in their ability to use technology and to be um, respond more positively, I suppose, to this increasing pressure to use technology in their teaching and also um, to be able to be resilient when things went wrong with technology as well. So the approach that we used um, was actually uh, quite interesting, I suppose. I'd worked on a number of leadership um, projects for the OLT around academic leadership. So we brought in some of the theories of change and change management um, and we, we pitch that very much within the broader context of the changes in higher education. That technology is here, it's um, going to be here in a greater capacity and really um, we wanted to give them some skills to be both adaptable to the use of ICT but also change agile as well. So we introduced some things like the theories of change, um, some leadership development. We also looked at um, uh, looking at their um, own individual reflection, how they perceive their own academic identity um, in relation to teaching and learning and where they saw themselves uh, in relation to their students and the use of technology. Uh, we also used from the leadership theory um, things like self-talk, um, looking at their cognitive patterns, um, we, looked, we, we did some sessions with them about faulty thinking and we also introduced the concept of mindfulness which in the United States they've done some studies with uh, teachers from secondary schools and primary schools I believe um, and they've actually shown that um, staff that have undergone mindfulness training are actually much more responsive to their students' needs and are able to stay calm and uh, are better teachers as a, as a consequence and it also um, helps support a lack of um, burnout or to stop people from burning out I suppose because it gave them some tools to manage the pressures um, of teaching in difficult schools so we brought that, that aspect in as well and we're lucky at Curtin here we actually have a very good counselling service that runs mindfulness sessions for staff and um, some of them have actually gone on as a consequence of the workshop that we did to do um, long-term courses around that. And the other thing we looked at as well was instead of um, typically staff are used or taught to use technology by they go along to a training session, this is how you use Blackboard and this is how you set it up and you click this button and do that and of course if there's a lag between training and actually implementing or using the, um, the software or the, the technology people often forget, you know, they're busy, um, they've got a lot going on and they, they, they forget how to use it, they forget the steps. So what we tried to do as well was um, develop higher order sort of system level thinking around around what are the kind of major components of um, any kind of software application or, or technology and um, we also introduced them to a range of sort of emerging technologies as well. I was going to say, does anyone have any questions at this point? Because we haven't actually given you the opportunity to, uh, to ask any questions. Uh, people can just type in questions if they wish into the uh, chat box, otherwise you could put your hand up if you wish to um, take the mic and ask a question. Okay, I don't think anyone's going to, I can't see anyone putting their hand up, so I'll keep going. Um, all right, so we actually uh, we, we designed our um, our workshop. Uh, we developed a pre and um, post questionnaire, which combined measures relating to attitudes to teaching and technology acceptance. Um, and then around the time of the first assessment uh, piece, we actually did 16 semi-structured interviews with the participants. I should say that we had about 25 of the of the 30 then 30 tutors in the unit who participated in our two-day workshop. Um, so from the 16, um, we had 16 semi-structured interviews following the workshop. Um, we then coded and analysed that data. Um, we had it done by a qualitative researcher using in vivo. And then towards the end of the semester, we um, once we had that information, all that data coded, we did two focus groups with approximately 12 of the um, tutors, who, and some, some of them didn't actually participate in the um, structured interviews to just check the themes that emerged as um, as a consequence of that data analysis. So it was quite interesting actually, we found that there was, was that 
well, initial findings suggest that we actually did shift people's idea about themselves as a teacher. In fact, the whole notion of agile teaching became um, uh, a common used, um, I don't know, tag or, or whatever about themselves. Or we're being agile, we're doing this, we're being responsive to our, to our students' needs and uh, we're, we're trying to use technology in a more productive way. So some of the, um, the things that people reported was um, an increased awareness of knowledge, adding to the existing knowledge. Um, they learned more about new software applications um, and they also developed or, or reminded themselves of some of those um, self-managing strategies around their thinking and also um, planning around how they might manage things if the technology failed for them. The majority also report, reported increased confidence, excitement, enthusiasm and motivation and, and they also felt empowered as well as a consequence of participating in, in the two-day workshop that we offered. And again, the, the majority also reported that they um, were actually taking action to improve their teaching practice to manage um, ICT challenges and also to um, improve their skills and um, be more innovative with the use of ICT. And what emerged was that there were um, particular characteristics related to staff who were agile with the use of ICT and agile in terms of being focused on the students. And one of the things that we strongly emphasised in the workshop was a shift from this notion, um, and it goes to academic identity, of the sage on the stage, which is the traditional notion of the academic as the holder of the knowledge, the expert in the field who then transmits that information to their students. And what we tried to do as well as part of the workshop was to get them to think a little bit differently about themselves in the context of the knowledge economy that we now work, uh, work in to see themselves more as a facilitator or a guide on the side. Um, so we actually got them to think, hopefully, at a more um, metacognition or have more um, consciousness around how they actually viewed themselves as an academic. So some of the things that emerged around um, being an, an agile um, academic and teacher, um, the characteristics that the, the participants demonstrated and identified were um, they identified very strongly as a professional and wanting to do a good job, um, their employment, employment state, status. Uh, so their professional identity really informed their commitment to looking at how they were working, how they were thinking and how they might do things differently. Their previous um, teaching and work experience also had an impact on um, the, how, they, how agile they viewed themselves and also their family experiences. Um, there are, I'll, I'll get to a little bit more, so I probably should have talked a bit about the participant group earlier, but um, a lot of them were women, they're sessional tutors who um, work casually teaching into the unit and they have families. So for them, being agile is, was almost part of their daily um, experience, managing competing demands and things going wrong as well and not being overwhelmed by, um, by that. So willingness to engage with others, mindful of others in the unit. And it is worth um, emphasising again that it was a unit that was um, team taught and in an interprofessional context. So we had staff from lots of different kinds of health science backgrounds teaching together. And they also um, reported that an agile teacher was someone who had the ability to employ interpersonal strategies. So managing the negative self-talk and um, faulty thinking that can often get in the way of um, being adaptive to change and being, um, being resilient as well. So people with a can-do attitude. So in terms of the actual participants, um, some of the problems obviously with our study um, was an issue of self-selection. The majority of the staff um, who attended the workshop and who teach into the unit are actually sessional staff. Um, a lot of them aren't enculturated into the university because um, they're not um, part of the main system. Um, and, and obviously they self-selected to attend the workshop. Um, there were some people who didn't, um, who chose not to attend, who perhaps had taught in the unit before or unable to, uh, to make it on the days that we set 
we set for the workshop. Um, one of the other things we probably we identified as an issue was that everyone that we were working with were um, health science um, professionals and or trained in the health sciences and we one of the things that we'd like to explore with um, with the training that we developed is how it would actually impact um, on staff or if indeed it would um, change um, attitudes with people from different disciplinary backgrounds. I've had experience working in academic leadership development for staff um, across the university and it does seem from my experience and my background is not health sciences that health science um, professionals have tend to be a little bit more um, how can I describe it um, <laughs> more um, open I suppose to sort of quality management processes as, an, as a, pra a practice I think as a consequence of their disciplinary backgrounds and the kinds of uh, health service environments that they might work in as a professional. Um, a lot of people have reported things like um, they wanted to do more, they were really inspired and empowered as a consequence of working in the um, or participating in the workshop but they were unable to do so because of just the sort of work life balance issues and not having enough time. Um, one of the other things we identified was that a change in behaviours like leadership development, all of those things, they actually require our ongoing time and commitment and time to reflect. It's not something that's going to happen in a two day workshop um, but we did um, I think from the findings that we've got there's some indication that there was a shift in behaviour. And the other thing that um, limited some of the staff from being agile, some were teaching into other units where they had more control over the content and what was going on because um, the foundations is quite a structured unit given the, nature, the number of students and, and tutors working in it. Um, but some of them actually reported, oh we couldn't do it in this unit because it was quite structured but I'm teaching this other unit and I went off and I did this. And there had been um, several examples where staff had actually gone across and developed, uh, engaged with technology, um, uh, developed uh, library guides, um, some of them had been using iPads and other classrooms introducing YouTube clips. I know some of these things seem quite ba basic but for some people who hadn't been using any of those technologies and hadn't been thinking about using them in the classroom, um, I think that was a, a quite a significant um, a change in behaviour for them. And one of the other things is we were, we were quite fortunate in fact to have one staff member who was um, not sessional on, a, on an ongoing contract and um, she was she was someone who probably represented more uh, the more um, the general academic population where people are very frustrated about this imposition of uh, electronic um, marking and assessment or, or technologies and use for use in the classroom. Um, and it was interesting, um, we were very fortunate to have her in the group because she, you know, it's that resistor who often um, raises the really interesting questions about what you're doing and, and the benefits and, and what have you. But it was interesting, she actually reported in the, uh, the final focus group which she participated in that um, she actually acknowledged that the participation in the workshop had actually shifted her thinking and that she'd gone off and developed um, um, an electronic library guide for her students as a consequence of participating in the unit. She was a little bit reluctant to admit it um, but it was quite interesting that she'd actually made that shift. So that's pretty much all for me. Um, do we want to go to a general discussion now? Yeah, thanks very much uh, for that and uh, now please if you've got any questions uh, for our speakers please either type in or if you'd like to take the microphone just click the little hand um, symbol and we'll hand the mic over to you. Well, I like that comment. Is it a Trojan horse as opposed to an elephant in the room? I think um, that's, that's certainly a, um, a challenge that we face and the pressures as I described at the beginning of how assessment may be slightly different or the pressures in assessment in the 21st century might be different will um, certainly bear out in that regard. At Curtin we've got a, a new project called Transforming Learning at Curtin and a significant component of that will be um, taking a look at assessment not only to map assessment across a course to ensure that um, graduate learning um, course learning outcomes and graduate attributes are attained, but also to look at trying to implement 
more authentic assessments or um, assessments that address higher order thinking skills. And I think that's going to be a fantastic challenge for us. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions popping up. I'll just give you a few more minutes. Okay, Jim, would you like to take the microphone? So just uh, click the uh, talk button. Are there other questions or comments from our participants tonight? Sorry, it's getting towards evening here in Australia. Sorry, that's why I said tonight. For those of you in other parts of the world, it'll be morning. Okay, Matthew's just put up the uh, feedback form. Uh, so while you're thinking up your questions, uh, if you wouldn't mind just clicking on that link on the screen and if you wouldn't mind just filling out the feedback for us because this actually helps us, uh, both the Assessment Scotland and Transforming Assessment, uh, to make sure that the webinar series meets your needs, uh, so if you wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, more questions there, I think Wilma's put in another question there. Jeff, I noticed uh, that uh, Will was asked, wanting to ask more about the workshops and how we organized them, what sort of time and effort was put in. If she can either type in what specifically she might want more detail on or if she's able to take the microphone, we'd love to hear from her. That's fine. We can um, follow up with Wilmer on that. Um, I wondered actually whether, uh, just on the on that, I know it's not on the assessment issue, but whether our speakers tonight wanted to make any comment about uh, presenting in the webinar series. Well, certainly. I think it's been a, a wonderful experience. Um, I was wondering how we would manage it with three of us swapping between different computers, but it seems to have worked out fantastically. Um, we had our third participant um, using the new um, or the, the iPad version, which is new to your set transforming assessment uh, series capabilities, and that, that has also worked quite well. Thank you. I see Yvonne's got a question there about non-written assessment items, so I wondered whether you wanted to make any comments about that. Um, yes, Yvonne. Um, other types of assessment can also be uh, incorporated into electronic mark marking workflow. And I've seen examples in the literature and, and on blogs and stuff where um, sometimes in order to use the, the rubric, so if you had a laptop in, in a session, if you're doing, somebody's doing an oral presentation, you can actually just pull up the marking rubric, but you may have to have the students submit um, the equivalent of a cover page or a declaration of originality or something like that so that there actually is a file. It's not that you're going to do any marking up on the file, Um, Courtney was saying that you couldn't hear me, is that right? No. Um, so you would still have to have some sort of file in the system. A question there about group feedback? Yeah, Courtney's just reminded me in this unit they do actually um, have reflections that are done in class um, just on, on a piece of paper and they're marked up. It depends on the system you're using. I guess I was thinking about uh, Turnitin and the workflow for that. But um, Blackboard itself, can you can um, just bring up a, uh, an e-rubric without having to have a submission. So any other questions from our participants tonight, this morning? Ricky's got a question there, if you want to uh, take that one. Uh, yes, Ricky, that was something that was raised by different staff, particularly in our focus groups when we did the university-wide survey. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating, as a, and Courtney is a, a physiotherapist, and Courtney's specialty is actually in ergonomics, is that um, while some people would potentially experience some eye strain or musculoskeletal discomfort in using a computer for longer periods of time, what I think we fail to address is um, the working 
positions and the workload of traditional marking. So it's not necessarily that uh, electronic marking um, introduces a whole pile of new things. It's just a change in some of them. Courtney, is there anything you want to say? You can borrow my headset. Oh, she says that's fine. Okay, Connie, uh, Codner, and Helen, uh, let, if I could just thank you very much uh, for your time today. That was excellent. You can see from the conversations that were in the chat that it's generated a lot of interest. And certainly from my point of view, I think I always love to see an approach that people have taken that is at scale. Uh, often we hear lots of really good ideas about assessment and how you might do it, but then you sit back and you think, well, how would I actually do that with a thousand students or how would I do it with 40 markers or something like that? So I think your presentation today has been excellent from that point of view. It's given us all a lot to think about. Uh, it's certainly given us a lot to be able to work with. And again, just to emphasize our relationship with eAssessment Scotland, it's been great to be able to have this joint activity. So we want to thank our colleagues at eAssessment Scotland for allowing us to be part of this. And also to remind everyone that this is just the first in a series of these jointly badged webinars. Uh, so please go and have a look at the eAssessment Scotland website uh, or look at the Transforming Assessment website for the rest of the webinars in this series. So thank you very much everyone, both our presenters and our participants for today.